Hey, welcome to Sipper Social Club. I'm Jeremy, and tonight I have a blind tasting of five different Springbank 12-year-old cast drinks. I figured I'd treat myself. I had five open bottles on the shelf. Which one do I prefer? Not really sure. They're all great in their own respect. Lots of different combinations of maturation going on with these. I'll go through one by one, taste them, let you know what I think, and tell you about why Springbank can be distilling 10 times the whiskey that they currently are and why they choose not to. When I notice these, taste them and choose my favorite. All right, the Springbank 12 cast strength. In my opinion, probably the whiskey that defines this distillery the most. Each of these coming in with different maturation types. Let's go through what batches we have. Starting right here with batch 15. This one was released in 2017. Comprises of 70% sherry, 30% ex-bourbon casks. This is batch 19, released in August 2019. It is 35% sherry, 65% ex-bourbon casks. This is batch 21, released in October of 2020. This one is using a combination of 45% sherry casks, 25% bourbon, 25% burgundy casks, and 5% port. This is batch 22, released April 2021, a 50-50 split of sherry and ex-bourbon casks. And the most recent batch I have, batch 23, released in September of 2021. This is 100% ex-bourbon matured. So a nice array of different cast type maturations going into these. All bottled between about 55 to 60% ABV. I've added five drops of water into a, what is about a half ounce pour for each. Let's get at it. All right, so I'm just gonna randomly mix these up. All right, so I'm right here on the end. So like I said, Springbank, this bottling, in my opinion, gives you the most amount of like what Springbank is. It's presented at cast strength at 12 years old. Um, it, it is lots of different maturation types, but this gives you that Springbank essence that like a lot of people describe it as like a funk. It's like this weird kind of mineral peat. Sometimes people describe it as like a, a wet sock, a minerality. A kind of like a, like a cheese almost. It's been described as many different things and people interpret it in many different ways, but it definitely gives you that Campbelltown essence that makes this, unique, makes this whiskey very unique compared to the rest of Scotland. I've reviewed some of these before. A lot of my notes are comprised of like fresh fruit, a little bit of peat, again that funkiness, comprised with like a minerality, a maritime kind of like wet rocks aspect to it. Maybe even like a little bit of diesel fuel, some like magic marker. Really interesting, what you would think be conflicting notes, but somehow they balance out with sweets, honeys, really nice vanillas, caramels, a lot of grungy kind of berry fruit, like raspberries, like picked fresh raspberries, strawberries, stuff like that. Yeah, this one's got a lot of that nice minerality, maritime, diesel fuel kind of note to it. Big arrival on the palate. That high ABV definitely makes itself known in this. Like a vintage kind of bookstore essence to it. It's kind of like that dank basement kind of note. And then a really nice sweetness. This brings it all together. Really nice. So this one, definitely more that berry fruit. I would say this one has a lot more sherry in it than the previous glass. Oh yeah, like chocolates and like fudges coming out of this one. Oh yeah. That's nice on the palate. So like a lot more like raspberry, strawberry fruit in this for sure. So that nice kind of like diesel element to it, I mean, the funkiness in this is really nice as well. Very, very good. This is another good one. So there was this article recently in Whiskey Magazine uh, interviewing the former, I believe, former marketing director of Springbank. And he talked about how this distillery has the capability of producing upwards of 750,000 liters of distillate every single year, but they're only producing about 170,000 liters. And kind of talked about, kind of vaguely, of why Springbank is staying this like smaller kind of distillery. He said that if you become bigger, you have to compete with the bigger brands. And I thought that was kind of shying away from what really is happening, in my opinion, anyway. I think Springbank is using this scarcity kind of marketing where they keep demand super, super high by keeping supply pretty low. They've got to this point where everyone wants Springbank and now you can't even buy their core range on the shelf without putting forth a lot of effort, waiting in lines, getting in lotteries, etc., etc. So essentially what they've done they created such a demand 
but they haven't kept up with supply. And what's that doing is creating a constant demand for their product, so their product is always gonna be in demand. And it's a way that they don't have to jeopardize their quality. I think it works. Um, I mean, something can be said about not wanting to produce more, having to source potentially barrels that aren't up to your standard. So I think it's completely fine, but I don't necessarily buy exactly what he was saying. And I'll link to the article down below if you want to take a look at the entire thing. But Springbank only employs 37 people in the distillery. That's way less than you might have thought. So they are keeping it this very kind of like grassroots, small, independent style, hands-on, uh, attention to detail distillery. But that's what makes good whiskey. So I guess they've kind of chosen not to ramp up production in hopes of keeping their quality consistent, which I think is completely fine. Let's go to glass three. Oh yeah. It seems like we're getting just heavier and heavier into the raw essence of Springbank here. That funk element even getting higher with this pour. Again, I get lots of different things going on. Everything from dungy basement, you know, like <laughs> water damaged wood to really nice sweet vanillas, really nice honey notes, berry fruit, and it all just kind of works together. Coastal elements, sea air, really, really good. I would say this one's got lots of stuff going on with it. Definitely get that gasoline note in here. This one is probably ramped up more than the previous two. Oh yeah, the nose on this glass. Maybe the best so far. This one, more tropical style fruit. Definitely get like a pineapple note on here. Yeah, wow. Tropical fruit, more so in this glass than I think the other ones for sure. Let's go last glass. Really nice on the nose. I say this one, has elements of what I got here, but this is more subtle on the nose, I think. Maybe like a little more refined in this one. So I reviewed some of these before. I've given them scores anywhere between, I think, 87 to 90. So all very, very good. The one batch I haven't reviewed, I believe was batch 19. That one I haven't reviewed yet. But if you look back, you can check all the scores. I think ranking for me, I thought this glass had the most amount of that like raw diesel kind of element to it. Yeah, this one hit your palate, I think the most aggressively, for sure. I was really digging this glass. This was the one I thought had some tropical fruit elements to it. Really, really nice. This nose I think is my favorite. Yeah, I think this nose and this finish, really, really good on this batch. Oh, but then this nose is even better, I think. This one has the best like caramel, vanilla and like honey aspect to it, I think. So this one has a lot of that spring bank, like raw distillate flavor for sure. This one's probably the X bourbon, the 100% X bourbon. It's hard to tell with the colors. It is kind of a giveaway with the color. This one looks a little light. It's kind of cheating a little bit, but I'd say this one maybe is the, is the all the X bourbon cast. Cause I don't get that much fruit. I don't know if I'm getting like the raspberry, like that dank raspberry note that you get with some of these like heavier sherry ones really does stick out for sure. You can tell right away. It's a, such a tough decision. It's really hard. They're all very, very nice. I would say my least favorite is this one. This is my least favorite because I thought it was maybe the most unbalanced and it gave me more of like a harsh finish, really heavy on that diesel note for this one for sure. But it did have a lot of complexity. I just think that this one didn't quite feel as balanced as the other four did. This one now giving me some of these like baking spices, kind of like Christmas cake element to this. Very, very good. I think I've made my decision. So I'm gonna say in fifth place, which is my least favorite of the five, was this glass here. This is batch 21. So batch 21, this was the one 45% sherry, 25% bourbon, 25% burgundy, 5% port. This is coming in at 56.1% ABV and it was October 8th, 2020 release. I reviewed this one before and I think that I kind of came to the same conclusion in my review that just a little bit of an imbalance and I think that the burgundy casks might have had something to do with that. In fourth place, I'm going with this glass here. This one is batch 15. Batch 15 is 70% sherry, 30% ex bourbon. It was released July 24th, 2017. So this is the oldest release that I have 
I have reviewed this one before. It was very, very close with these, and I'm surprised that this is the most sherry, because I don't think I would have guessed that. I'll go this one as my fourth, third place. Third place is this one, batch 22. So this is the 50% sherry, 50% ex bourbon. I have reviewed this one before, and I remember really loving it. Yeah, this is the most balanced. And being 50% sherry, 50% ex bourbon makes sense. Really, really nice. So this one I would say second place. And this is batch 23, which is the 100% ex bourbon. So I was correct with that, even though I kind of cheated and looked at the color, it looks pretty light. This one I reviewed before, and this one I really, really like. This does give you that spring bank, um, stripped down, kind of like raw version where there's no sherry added. It's just, it's just an ex bourbon maturation. But man, you get a lot of great stuff out of this. Really, really nice. So that leaves uh, batch 19. The one I haven't reviewed, 35% sherry, 65% ex bourbon. This nose and finish on this one, my goodness. Outstandingly good, really, really nice. I'll have to do a full review of this whiskey. So there you have it. Um, batch 19 was a 2019 release. If you haven't checked out my Patreon before, take a look. You can get some really awesome samples sent to you. You can get some free merchandise, some guaranteed samples. You can put your name in to potentially win a sample. If you want to join the biggest tier, I go on the secondary market and I hunt bottles for you. Very, very recently, I went out and I got a bottle of Springbank 12 cash train for a Patreon because he had never had it before. I got him batch 19. That's the one I just picked as my favorite out of this lineup. So if you're interested in checking out Patreon, you enjoy the channel, check out the link down below. You can join for as little as a dollar, get our podcast sooner than everyone else. You can go all the way up to the biggest tier, get merchandise, samples guaranteed, draw for samples. Plus I go out and get bottles for you on the secondary market. If that interests you, check out the link down below. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Really much appreciated. If you have a comment about Springbank, leave it down below. What do you think of their distillery only staying at certain production levels and not ramping up like they potentially could, only having 37 employees, not expanding the, the way that other distilleries have expanded? Let me know in the comments down below what you think about that and Springbank 12 in general. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Really much appreciated. I go to Sipper Social Club, where we sip things. And we socialize. And we socialize, and it's a club. <laughs>